Hello, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's e-showcase, which aeration blower technology fits your application. I would like to thank today's sponsor, Atlas Copco. And I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenters. Gatlin Gold is Atlas Copco's Municipal Sales Manager for Western and Southern United States. He has over a decade of experience working with municipal customers and specializes in all aspects of wastewater project management, from the initial specification all the way through to the installation, running and ongoing optimization of the facility. Gatlin has produced many case studies and white papers on wastewater projects, detailing the optimization and savings that were possible. Gatlin has a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Distribution from Texas A&M. Paul Peterson is Atlas Copco's Municipal Sales Manager for Central and Eastern United States. Paul has been working with municipal customers across the country for over a decade. His focus is on providing solutions for water and wastewater engineers, operators, and contractors. Paul has authored and published many technical white papers and is an accomplished presenter on the topic of blower optimization and compressed air usage. Paul has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering technology from the University of North Carolina. And with that, Gatlin and Paul, I'm going to hand the presentation over to you. All right, I believe uh, everybody should be able to see my screen now. That's uh, I just want to say hello to everybody and thank you all for coming. Today we are going to go over which blower technology best fits your application. We'll start with a brief overview of technologies available, typical applications, and consideration factors, followed by a deeper look into each technology and what applications they work best in. Blowers have been around for over 160 years since the Root Brothers, pictured here on the right, figured out that a water pump could also move air. The technology keeps evolving, but blowers have become a constant fixture in the wastewater industry. Applications are also evolving to meet continually increasing effluent demands and regulations. Locations and atmospheres also require a diversity of applications to meet different constraints, such as big physical plant size. There are many variables to consider when choosing a blower technology. You have blower characteristics and plant requirements. range of the blower it requires attention to the range of flow, pressure, and turndown. These variables apply to the plant air among other considerations. See alone is not enough to make a decision. You wouldn't buy the most efficient blower on the market if it only runs for 10 hours a week or if your energy costs are somewhere around two cents per kilowatt hour. You also shouldn't put a blower that has limited start stops in a process that turns on and off more than three times a day, for example. Control systems for the blower, whether integral or remote, run in conjunction with control systems for the plant. Is the, plant, is the plan to control with speed, pressure, flow, or other process variables such as DO or ORP? Site conditions also play a large part. Is the unit going to be indoors? What is the range of ambient conditions such as temperature? What type of precipitation are you going to see? And is the unit located in a hazardous environment? All of these are factors that can affect your decisions and depend on your process, which is why it helps to have someone who is familiar and has experience with all of the options. Paul, can you tell them a little bit about the different blower options? Absolutely, Gatlin, thank you. So this is what I like to call the blower family tree. On the left, we have the centrifugal side of the family, and on the right, we have the positive displacement side, also known as the volumetric compressors. Those are the rotary screw and the trilobe or bilobe positive displacement blowers. The centrifugal or dynamic compressors are the multi-stage centrifugal. And then in single stage, we have the high-speed direct drive turbo, whether magnetic bearing or airfoil bearing. 
and then the integrally geared single stage centrifugal. If we go to the next slide, we'll take a closer look at our centrifugal technologies. First, we have the multi stage. This is one of the most versatile products in that it's available in the widest range of sizes. It starts at around five horsepower or 100 CFM and goes up to 40,000 CFM and several thousand horsepower in size. Next, we have the high speed turbo, one of the most popular blower technologies on the market today. These generally start around 100 horsepower, uh, about 500 CFM at minimum speed and then go upwards of about 10,000 CFM at maximum speed with a 500 horsepower motor. And lastly, the integrally geared single stage centrifugal is what I like to call the big iron because they typically start around 200 horsepower or 4,000 CFM. And again, go upwards of 40,000 CFM plus into the three, 4,000, maybe more horsepower. The positive displacement technologies. First, we have the rotary screw. This is a newer style of positive displacement technology that tends to be more efficient in most applications. But they generally start at 25 horsepower, which would be 150 CFM at minimum speed. And then at maximum speed with a 500 horsepower motor, they can go upwards of 5,000 CFM. And the rotary lobe the original blower, the PD, whether tri-lobe or bi-lobe, typically starts at one horsepower, although some manufacturers even offer fractional horsepower PD lobe blowers, but generally starting at 30 CFM and going up to four or 5,000 CFM around 350 horsepower. If we look at all those technologies on one big working area map, if we have any engineers with us today, you may recall thermodynamics class. This would be your PV diagram. We have pressure on the Y axis and flow on the X. We can see that the positive displacement technologies dominate the low end of the flow range, the lobe and the screw. In the middle, we have the high speed turbo. And then where the high speed turbo ends, around eight to 10,000 CFM, we have a big jump into the tens of thousands of CFM. That's roughly around 500 horsepower, where we typically have to use medium voltage power supplies. Medium voltage VFDs have historically been physically large and prohibitively expensive, but the geared single state centrifugal and the multi-state centrifugal are the two technologies available that are capable of varying their flow output without the use of a VFD. But we'll get into that later. For now, I'm gonna turn it back over to Gatlin to tell us about the high-speed turbo. All right, thank you, Paul. So uh, looking a little deeper into the high-speed turbo. Uh, if you're relatively new to the blower world, the high-speed turbo blower design involves a turbo-style impeller connected directly to a motor shaft. These units are small and compact for the power and airflow they can deliver, thanks to running at high speeds, anywhere from around 15,000 RPM to 45,000 RPM. They're almost always packaged with VFDs and controls because they require very specific and finely tuned components to keep them operational. Some of the key benefits are that they are high efficiency, fully integrated plug and play packages with very low maintenance due to the lack of lubrication required. Some of the key things that aren't in favor of the high-speed turbo are the initial cost and the high complexity that tends to make them averse to major modifications. Another important thing to note is that not all high-speed blowers are created equal. What are some of these inequalities, you might ask? Most larger units come with permanent magnet synchronous motors, which retain a very high efficiency at partial loads compared to induction motors, which are more common in smaller units. Water-cooled motors do require a cooling flush about every five years, but they are also able to keep a more stable temperature. High temperatures can weaken magnets over time, and more temperature fluctuations means greater expansion and contraction of materials, which equals more stress on the unit. This also amounts to more clearance being required within the unit, meaning that they are less efficient. Bearings are another characteristic that varies between manufacturers and models, which fall into two major categories. Air bearings are low cost, 
use no power and are a relatively simple concept, but have a limited number of start stop cycles due to the high speed contact before and after liftoff. Surge events and overheating due to low back pressure can also drastically decrease their lifetime. Magnetic bearings, on the other hand, can constantly levitate the shaft and actively control it to prevent contact in almost any situations, making them more robust. The downside is that they cost more and are fairly complex systems. The BOV setup of these units is evolving to meet the very varying needs of process requirements. Traditionally, the BOV is used to relieve pressure during startup and shutdown, or for any event that causes the units to shut down. Emerging BOV control can not only do this, but can also regulate beyond the surge line without shutting the units down. Modulating the blow-off as a secondary control allows for a unit with 100% turndown. So here's where the high-speed turbo falls on the list of criteria. Good at efficiency and maintenance, not so good at initial cost and working in harsh environments. Applications in which the turbo is best, the best solution really depend on the energy cost, but for the most part should require a lot of the air for a lot of the time. Variable pressure applications can be okay due to onboard controls keeping the output steady, but applications that have numerous starts and stops are not great specifically for air bearing units, which drags down their performance for applications like SBR and filter backwash. Moving on to the intergly geared range. The intergly geared turbo uses a large single turbo wheel, typically spinning at sub 20,000 RPM speeds. This is achieved through a gearbox mated to a 3600 RPM motor. All of the larger fixed speed units use inlet guide vanes to vary their output. Some models coordinate this with variable diffuser guide vanes to alter their efficiency, which makes them efficient, very efficient, throughout most of their range. Variable speed models also have recently become popular for low voltage units. One of the key features of this technology is that a single unit can produce the most flow out of any technology. The cost of these units is typically keeps them reserved for large airflow applications. The principles of how they work follow that of all centrifugal machines. Inlet air is centrifugally forced from the inside of the impeller to the outside, creating a very high air velocity. This high velocity air hits the diffusers, which slow it down and increase the pressure. The inlet guide vane shown can be closed, closed to decrease the inlet pressure, which increases the differential pressure across the impeller. This in effect decreases the output and input power required. The intergly geared units are unique as that they can give an inlet air a pre-swirl with the inlet guide vanes and they can change their discharge guide vanes which are a key to the efficiency of the unit. Regarding maintenance, there are several things to look out for uh, as costs can typically add up quickly. The highest quality gears are important to ensure long life without issues as the gearbox of these units is where most of the work is done and most of the stresses are located. Horizontally split gearboxes can also significantly reduce repair times. Tilting pad hydrodynamic bearings typically require forced oil lubrication to create a film for the shaft to ride on so that it doesn't come into contact with stationary parts uh, at high speeds. Secondary electric oil pumps are typically used to provide enough oil pressure at startup, while a primary mechanical pump typically takes over once the units are up to speed. Integrally geared units are typically used for providing a large volume of air greater than 10,000 CFM. They can be designed to a very wide range of pressures as long as the pressures don't change much during the process. The downside is that they typically have the highest capital cost, largest footprint, and relatively high maintenance cost compared to other technologies. Like their smaller siblings, the direct drive turbo, these units are great for applications using a high volume of air constantly due to their efficiency. Unlike their smaller siblings, they typically do not see a great return on investment for smaller applications. Furthermore, it is not a great idea to constantly turn these units on and off in an application like SBR.
Looking at the multi-stage, you can see that it has a very large operating map due to the many different configurations available. Multi-stage centrifugal blowers have been a mainstay since their invention in the early 1900s. It's not uncommon for these machines to last 50 years if installed and maintained correctly. They can be either inlet throttled or variable speed, and they can handle a variety of gases in both vacuum and overpressure applications. One of the main drawbacks is their installation costs due to all of the extra external components that can be required to make a system function properly. The theory behind the multi-stage is fairly simple. For more flow, you increase the diameter of the casing and impellers, and for more pressure, you would increase the number of stages. Different impeller combinations can also be easily combined to fine tune the flow and pressure to achieve decent efficiency at almost any point. This is a typical air blower package using inlet throttle control. You can see that these machines take up a lot of space once installed with all of their accessories. That is why installation can take considerable amounts of time and can cost more than other available technologies. There are also several control methods available with varying cost and efficiencies. So how do you choose which one to use? <clears throat> if you are not familiar, this is a pressure versus flow graph for showing centrifugal performance. The blue curve shows full speed performance of a typical multi-stage. The green dot shows the design point below the curve, meaning that uncontrolled, we would be providing too much air with this unit. Blowing off air is an effective but wasteful method of meeting your process's design point. It reduces the air to the process, but it uses the same amount of power as if providing excess air. That is why it is an uncommon practice unless specifically required for protection of the process or the blower. Inlet throttling is the most common control method for multi-stage due to being used both manually and automatically. It provides good turndown and has a high rise to surge and saves power. Variable speed operation is the most efficient for the multi-stage as it can change the blower's best efficiency point by varying the speed. The downside is that this typically needs to be automated to keep a reasonable rise to surge, which adds to the cost. Due to the millions of possible sizes and configurations, the multi-stage is fairly well-rounded. One of the best attributes is its acclimations to harsh environments and the ability to handle very nasty gases. In its base form, it can also be relatively inexpensive due to the age of the technology. Again, like other centrifugal technologies, 24-7 operation is good due to efficiency. Processes with variable pressure can be tolerated but require throttling to keep a steady flow as small changes in pressure can swing the flows greatly. Unlike other centrifugal technologies, the ability to handle harsh gases and be placed in a variety of ambient conditions without protection makes the multi-stage stand out. Now I'll let uh, Paul tell you a little bit more about the positive displacement units. Thanks, Gatlin. So I'll start first with the most common blower, the rotary lobe or traditional PD style. If we look at the next slide, the lobe, along with being the original blower is obviously a proven technology, but it's really valued in this industry for its low investment cost. In fact, it has the lowest cost per CFM for capital equipment compared to any technology we're discussing today. It also has good turndown, generally 15% or more, and it can do air or gas in vacuum or pressure applications. Some of these blowers from certain manufacturers are field customizable. You can install switches, gauges in the discharge or intake piping, and you can replace sheaves or pulleys to alter the blower's operating characteristics after it's been installed. However, the drawbacks of this technology are that it is the least efficient technology that we're discussing today. It also has by far the highest noise levels. And if you get one of these field customizable packages from a third party fabricator, you may have some surprises in installation cost compared to a plug and play 
solution from a different vendor. If we go to the next slide, we'll see a photograph of a plug and play package. This one with integrated VFD controls and local controller. You see that this doesn't actually expand the footprint of this particular blower at all, and it maintains all of the original package components. These are a fairly simple design. There is an air filter mounted on top of the blower element itself, which is belt driven off a pivoting motor base from an electric motor. This whole assembly sits on a base frame with integrated discharge silencer, and typically the check valve and pressure relief or safety valve are integrated inside the enclosure. These units require a bit of maintenance. Pardon us. These units require a bit of maintenance in that uh, there's filter changes, obviously, when dirty, like any technology. They use splash lubrication, which require oil changes, typically every six months of operation. And the belts will wear out, which requires replacement every six months to a year. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see the working principle of the rotary load blower. On the right, we have a cross-sectional view of the blower element itself. Air enters the top of this unit. If we look at our PV diagram on the left, this is from four to one. Air enters at constant pressure, atmospheric pressure, which is nominally 14 and a half PSI. When we get to the light blue pocket there on the right, we're actually moving the air to the discharge of the blower. When we hit the location of the red dot, that's our actual compression point. We discharge air at constant volume at a higher pressure from two to three on the PV diagram. This is where the compression happens at the discharge flange in the silencer or the process pipe. This compression cycle is known as external compression. So the blue area under the working area curve is proportional to the power consumed. Let's go to the next slide. The rotary lobe has by far the lowest capital cost of any of the technologies here today. It's also, due to its fairly simple nature, very well suited for harsh environments. Its biggest drawback is, in fact, its low efficiency. The applications that lend themselves to the rotary lobe are generally widespread, but they are particularly suited to applications that are intermittent duty due to their low efficiency or applications that aren't suited to other centrifugal technologies, such as things with variable pressure like aerobic digesters or SBRs. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about the rotary screw blower. As I mentioned earlier, this is a form of a more efficient positive displacement technology, but we'll get to that in a minute. Next slide. The benefits of the rotary screw are that it's typically available as a plug and play fully integrated design with local Y delta starter or VFD controls inside the box, along with all your filters, silencers, check valves, etc. Because of that, they have relatively low installation cost. They also have low noise levels. Uh, the only thing less noisy than the rotary screw tends to be the high speed turbo. But the biggest benefit of this technology is its fantastic operating range. The rotary screw technology has an 80% turndown, or five to one, meaning a thousand CFM rotary screw blower can turn down to roughly 200 CFM. That combined with the fact that their efficiency curve is relatively flat, means that a rotary screw blower operating at maximum speed is usually just as efficient as it operating at minimum speed. This has several advantages in wastewater treatment that we'll talk about in just a bit. The one drawback of this technology, however, is that it is more expensive than its positive displacement cousin, the rotary lobe. Next slide, please. Here we see a rotary screw blower package. This one you'll see does not have a belt drive. It's actually a gearbox drive meaning there are no belts to change ever. So we eliminate one of those annual or biannual service intervals that the cousin, the rotary lobe has. This particular model also uses force lubrication, which is filtered and cooled compared to the splash lubrication or grease pack lubrication of the rotary lobe. 
That force lube circuit means oil changes are only required every other year or every 16,000 operating hours compared to every 4,000 operating hours with the splash lubricated rotary lobe. Next slide. Here we see the working principle of the rotary screw. Air is drawn into the element from the top at one end of the helical rotor and then is squeezed as we reduce the volume inside the compression chamber along the rotor to the opposite side of the casing. If we look at the next slide, we'll see that PV diagram. So by squeezing that air inside the compression chamber, we cut a section of area out from under the curve. That's shown in this green triangle here on the slide. That green triangle is your energy savings. At seven or eight PSI, this is nominally 30% efficient. But as we'll see soon, the more pressure increases, the more the rotary screw starts to shine when it comes to efficiency. I like to say that the more you squeeze, the more you can save. And that's shown on this next chart. This is the results of a bench test performed by a third party uh, validation test. This is a 100 horsepower rotary screw with VFD and a 100 horsepower rotary load blower with VFD operated across a range of flows and pressures in a calibrated test cell. Now we are measuring discharge flow and input power according to ISO 1217 Annex E. That is the globally accepted test code for blowers with integrated VFD controls. So this is true wire to air power. It's very similar to the recently released ASME PTC 13 test standard here in the United States. So at 20%, sorry, at 7 PSI, there's about 20% energy savings with the screw compared to the lobe. At 9.5 PSI, about 30%. And then at 11 PSI G and higher, there's up to 50% energy savings or more possible with rotary screw technology. If we go to the next slide, we'll see the greatest benefit of this technology, the turndown. So on this chart, we have the rotary lobe, power versus flow curve in black, and the rotary screw in yellow. We can see that the screw starts off more efficient than the lobe, and as it turns down, we see that the lobe starts to slip. This is quite literal, because towards the minimum speed of the rotary lobe, you actually get more air slipping past that straight rotor as the element heats up, meaning it gets less efficient as it turns down. But the relatively flat efficiency curve of the rotary screw remains. So by being able to turn down 30% slower than its cousin, the rotary lobe, the rotary screw is capable of 30% better process control. The added benefit of operating at that low speed is the helical rotor has less slip, meaning it's more efficient at minimum speed. So slowing down 30% more results in 45% lower power consumed at minimum speed compared to the rotary lobe. We go to the next slide. We'll talk about noise. So a traditional rotary lobe blower with a sound enclosure is typically around 85 dBA or 85 decibels. The average rotary screw blower is around 75 decibels, maybe lower. Each two to three reduction in decibels on the H scale is twice as quiet when perceived by the human ear. That means that the rotary screw is actually four times quieter than the average rotary lobe. Now for reference, 85 decibels is also the common sound pressure level for multi-stage centrifugal and integrally geared centrifugal packages that do not have enclosures. Meanwhile, the high-speed turbo in an enclosure typically has decibel levels below 70 and sometimes below 65 dBA, making them the quietest blowers on the market. Next slide. So the rotary screw 
as I mentioned, has the best turndown of any of the technologies we've discussed today. It's also great at handling high pressure applications or applications at very high altitudes. It has very good efficiency and fairly good capital cost compared to other options on the market. The applications suited to the rotary screw are on the next slide. In general, the screw is great at applications with varying pressure and varying flow. Applications where we can use that wide turn down range and that flat efficiency curve to our advantage. So traditional activated sludge or lagoon aeration, if there it's a deeper lagoon. And then of course, SBR, aerobic digester, and IFAS. Next slide, please. So let's put this all together. When selecting a blower technology for your application, if you have a variable pressure application, something with a varying liquid depth, like an SBR or an aerobic digester, stick with the positive displacement technologies and avoid the centrifugal machines. If you have a gas application, like digester gas exhausting, then you wanna use the more traditional robust technologies the lobe and the multi-stage. They tend to hold up better in those harsh environments. Then it, the selecting the correct blower comes down to your duty point, the flow and pressure. If you're below 100 horsepower, the rotary lobe is going to typically be your most cost-effective solution. Meanwhile, the rotary screw is going to be your most efficient solution in most applications. Above 100 or 150 horsepower, the screw becomes the most economical solution where the high-speed turbo becomes the more efficient solution. And then above four or 500 horsepower, the multi-stage centrifugal is the best option for customers who are focused on capital cost. Those aiming for the best efficiency would select the integrally geared single-stage centrifugal. As far as pressure goes, if you're below seven PSI, you want to avoid the rotary screw as it starts to lose efficiency below that internal compression ratio. You also should avoid high-speed turbo blowers with airfoil bearings as low pressure tends to cause them to lose the wedge or shaft levitation, which can be costly in the long term when it comes to maintenance or reliability. But most applications in this industry are between 7 to 15 PSI, and if that's the case, nearly all the technologies come into play depending, depending on your flow rate. And then lastly, if you have a very deep tank that you're trying to aerate, or if you have an application at a very high elevation, somewhere in the Rocky Mountains or the Andes Mountains, uh, anywhere over a mile high, you're going to wanna look at the rotary screw if you're cost conscious or the single stage centrifugal for efficiency. And then finally, we have our last slide. This is a list of common wastewater applications as discussed earlier. And then on the right, we have our recommended technologies for each one. So for traditional activated sludge, where the air requirements are generally a fixed pressure, but variable flow, nearly all technologies come into play. It will largely be dependent upon the size of your plant. In an aerated lagoon, it's a very similar application, typically with lower pressure and slightly varying pressure and variable flow. In this case, high-speed turbo blowers, multi-state centrifugal blowers, or rotary lobe are typically best suited to this application. An SBR or a sequencing batch reactor has widely varying swings in pressure and flow and is often intermittent duty. This means it should absolutely not be used with an airfoil turbo, but those positive displacement technologies, the screw and the lobe are a great fit. An MBBR or moving bed biological reactor tends to be a high flow application. Pressure could be variable or fixed depending on the vessel. So an integrally geared single stage, rotary screw, high speed turbo or multi-stage centrifugal are great technologies here. The MBR or membrane bioreactor is typically a fixed pressure application with variable flow 
and then typically an intermittent air scour application to clean the reactor itself. Here, the rotary screw, magnetic bearing high-speed turbo, or rotary lobe are typically a good fit. The IFAS, or integrated fixed film activated sludge process, is typically a fixed pressure varying flow application, so a high-speed turbo multi-state centrifugal or screw tend to be a good fit. Aerobic digesters are typically variable flow and pressure, intermittent duty, so again, those positive displacement technologies, the lobe and the screw are best suited here. And then lasty, digester gas exhausting or any application where you're drawing air off the top of the tank and there could be some H2S or other potentially corrosive agents in there, you should stick with the older technologies that are more robust, the multi-state centrifugal and the rotary lobe. At this time, I believe we'll turn it back over to Regina for questions. Regina? Yes, sure. This was great. This is everyone's opportunity to go ahead and chat some great questions or comments in your chat. Go ahead and select the everyone option. That way the presenters and the attendees will be able to see your great questions. So we'll go ahead and do that. And Paul and Gatlin, while we're waiting for those great questions to come in, if you want to expound on something and go ahead and continue, we can do that. I think uh, we gave a lot of people a lot of information in a very short amount of time. So we'll let the questions come to us if they have any. All right, great. We'll give them a few minutes. Looks like Brian just wants to let you know that uh, those application tables were a great addition. Thank you, Brian. All right, so it looks like um, we may, oh, here we go. We might have a couple coming through. Uh, we've just got, uh, can you speak more on selecting between high speed turbo versus rotary screw for activated sludge application? Sure, oh, you want to take can. that one? Sure. Um, I think it's really going to depend on the size of the plant and the air demand. Uh, if you've got less than 2,000 CFM total air required, then realistically you're going to probably be uh, in the rotary screw range um, where you probably have 250 horse blowers or something like that. If you've got 3,000 CFM or more total flow required to your activated sludge process, then the high-speed turbo uh, might be a good fit. Now, again, energy is the most, uh, the highest component of total cost of ownership. So if you're looking for lowest life cycle cost, uh, then the turbo in that 100 horsepower or more size is probably going to have the lowest life cycle cost. If you're looking for capital cost, the rotary screw option is probably going to be a fraction of the cost of the high-speed turbo in an activated sludge application. All right, perfect. And then Joel looks like he just wants to confirm. He says an elevation of 4,000 feet would be considered a high elevation. I'll take that one, Paul. So. So Joel, when we're talking about the high elevations that the screws are more suited to, it kind of goes with the same principle as, um, you know, above seven PSI, your screws are going to be more efficient. So uh, if you have, if your standard rating is at 14.7 PSI and you move it and uh, seven PSI uh, G is where you want uh, to start looking at the screw, then if you move to a situation where, uh, the inlet pressure was 12 psi. Uh, that would effectively decrease the air, the pressure where the screw starts to become more effective because of the pressure differential that the unit is going to see. So that that's why we said at higher elevations the screw can come in handy uh, simply due to the pressure ratio. Okay, great. And then we've got another one that says uh, variable speed drives can be used with any type of blower. That's correct. 
typically they can be used on almost every style of blower. Now I will say that uh, centrifugals operated at their minimum speeds on a VFD are much less efficient than centrifugals operated uh, at their maximum speeds or maybe um, at 80% of their maximum speed. So it's good to always evaluate the efficiency of a technology with multiple design points, not just your theoretical maximum or your daily average, but also the minimum. And to look at seasonality, the efficiency of a blower in summer at 100 degrees versus in winter at zero degrees will vary greatly. So have your manufacturer or your engineer look at several duty points at several times of the season to get a better overall picture of the efficiency of a blower uh, operated on a VFD. All right, great. We've got a couple more. We've got one. What kind of process control options do you include for activated sludge aeration applications? Uh, it really depends on the, the technology that you're going with. Uh, of course, you can get a master control panel that uh, operates pretty much any way you want it to. Uh, but for activated sludge, uh, flow control based off of DO tends to be uh, one of the better suited uh, control methods uh, where your process is looking at the DO and for a specific basin, whether it's one or several different ones. Uh, and then you have automated valves to adjust uh, where the air is going between different basins if you have them. And then all of that going back to a, a central controller that basically decides how much flow you need uh, as a total to decide which blowers you're going to use uh, and where. Yep. I would just elaborate by saying that, uh, you know, we at Atlas Copco can really provide a very simple control, a single probe into a basin uh, feeding back to one or two blowers um, all the way up to, you know, s multiple aeration trains, multiple process headers, handling the mostly open valve control logic, uh, potentially handling other uh, equipment like mixers, if it's a very simple operation, we can integrate that all into one process panel. It's really a function of uh, the desired efficiency and usually the budget. All right, great. We've got one last one. We've got uh, Patrick that's saying, a young engineer asked me to recommend a good textbook on blowers. Can you recommend one? I'm going to let you carry that one, Paul. <laughs> All right. So actually, uh, WEF um, has some uh, reference materials. Uh, I don't think there is a textbook specifically on blowers, but the WEF aeration handbook does go into a pretty good amount of detail when it comes to blowers, uh, efficiency, design, operation, maintenance. So I would check the WEF library uh, for those resources. Um, and then obviously, you know, manufacturers uh, such as ourself, uh, we're always experts in the technologies that we manufacture, uh, which fortunately for us is all the ones we presented here today. Uh, but if you're looking at a specific technology, working directly with a reputable manufacturer or several, uh, you can get a good idea of um, different applications, uh, efficiencies, benefits, and the like. All right, great. We've got one more that will probably take us right to the top of the hour. It just popped in. Can you provide a bit more detail on why the rotary screw was more efficient than the lobe? You mentioned squeezing, but doesn't the lobe squeeze as well? So technically, yes, the lobe does squeeze as well, but the difference is internal compression versus external compression. And of course, relating to the element versus external relating to outside of the element or in the discharge piping. Uh, if you kind of remember the concept of the lobe, what it does is it basically all it does is move air around from the inlet to the outlet. And as it's shoving it out the casing, what's it, what that's doing is compressing the air as it's leaving the casing. So uh, external to the unit. Uh, whereas what the screw does, if you remember the diagram on uh, 
how the screws are put together and the air moves from one end of the rotors to the other end of the rotors, basically those screws are set at an angle. So they have a lot more clearance on the intake side and a lot less clearance on the discharge side. So the unit, just by moving that air from one side to the other, is also compressing the air uh, and then releasing it into the discharge. And what that internal compression does is allow us to achieve uh, that pressure increase uh, of running through the unit without much power penalty. So whereas, say you have a screw that's basically catered to six PSI or seven PSI based on the manufacturer's designs, uh, the screw would autom automatically just by turning and moving the air, get the air up to six or seven PSI, whereas the lobe would have to have something putting back pressure on it to achieve that pressure. So that's where the screw uh, gains efficiency with the internal compression. I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this was great. This actually take us, takes us to, the, to our time, but we did get one more question. I'm sure you can answer this one pretty quickly. Do you have additional information in, on your website? Yes, we certainly do. You can go to uh, atlascopco.com. We have uh, two separate sites that may be a benefit. We have one dedicated to our blower products. So if you go to the website and search for blower, and you can also go to our website and search for wastewater. And we have a page dedicated to wastewater applications with some case studies and additional resources there. All right, perfect. This was actually great. This is That question is going to take us right to the end of our time. This actually concludes our uh, presentation for today. I want to thank everybody for attending, and I also want to thank our presenters, Paul and Gatlin. Great job. Thank you so much. And a huge thank you to our sponsor, Atlas Copco. And this, the recording will be available at westbuyersguide.wef.org. We will be sending all registrants an email tomorrow with the link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>